we're complex beings, right? Like we're capable of holding two things at the same time. You know, we're capable of holding professional boundaries and forming connections. We're capable of, you know, recognizing similarities in our experience and also, you know, withholding bias, right? Um, You know, and I think maybe that comes with skill as you, you know, move through the profession and have more experience under your belt. But, you know, I think a lot of people are really capable of doing those things in a way that like maybe our training didn't give us credit for. Everything Everything is is working out for me. It's working out for you, too. It just takes believing that it is. We can have, be, and do anything. The key is to care about how you feel and choose to feel good right now. I'm here today with Dallas Luna. She is a trauma therapist and host of the Healing Mama podcast. And we're going to be having a discussion that I'm really kind of excited about because Dallas and I connected because we're both therapists and we kind of connected on this issue that a lot of people don't talk about. And that's how therapists are kind of held to this standard of kind of being like a superhuman, somebody who doesn't have a real life, doesn't have problems. And we're really encouraged to not bring our personal selves into the therapy process. But sometimes that's impossible to do. And sometimes it's really not the best way to go about the therapeutic process. And this is something that Dallas and I kind of connected on and agree on. So I wanted to share it with all of you guys. Um, In addition, Dallas has an amazing story. She has a unique story in her life and something that she just recently shared with the world through her podcast. And we're going to highlight that as well. So Dallas, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Can you just give everybody a little introduction to who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I am a little bit nervous. Um, Part of being here is like my challenge to myself to, you know, step into my authenticity and talk about some of these things that are difficult for me to talk about publicly. And so I'm still in the process of like getting comfortable with that. So Um, I hope that I articulate my thoughts and myself well, but yes, so I am a trauma therapist. I've been working in the field for over 10 years, um, and I work primarily with adults who've experienced all kinds of trauma. Um, And through that, you know, I've learned a lot of things about myself, about my own experiences of trauma. But what's really led me to this point in my career and creating the Healing Mama podcast was my birth trauma experience. That was kind of like the catalyst for, um, you know, finding a way through the trauma, figuring out a new path. Um, And so I'd like to kind of like back up a little bit to, you know, why I created that podcast and what my intention was. Um, So initially, when I decided I wanted to create a podcast, I had interviewed a few people, recorded a few episodes, and then stopped. And, you know, maybe about a year went by, and I really hadn't done anything with it. And so I had to ask myself, like, if this is something that you really want to do, what's stopping you? And you know that there's always like an underlying reason. And so I did a little bit of like self-exploration. And what I first came to was this idea of um, fear of vulnerability, fear of judgment around my story, my experiences. Um, And actually, it was in preparation for our conversation today that I uncovered something even deeper, which is arguably even more painful than the the possibility of being judged is the possibility of being invisible. And, you know, it was really kind of like an aha moment for me today when I was thinking about it, which is this idea that, you know, if you share the most vulnerable parts of yourself and you bear your soul, what if nobody cares to listen? And so, 
you know, I was looking back on some of these experiences, my birth trauma, and started connecting all of these dots, right? Like one of the biggest factors in my traumatic birth was feeling dismissed by my provider, feeling like my voice wasn't being heard. And so the Healing Mama podcast is really about me healing myself, healing my own trauma, and rediscovering my voice. Because as you know, like through trauma, one of the um, symptoms of trauma is this loss of connection to your voice, that being invisible can sometimes be associated with safety. That, you know, if I keep myself hidden, then maybe the trauma won't find me. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but you know, what kept us safe during the trauma is not always what we need in order to heal and to thrive in our lives after the trauma. Good and point. so I'm sort of like coming to terms with that concept and figuring out like, how do I share my experiences and share my story and allow myself to be seen in a way that feels safe to me and like overcome that fear of invisibility? What if people don't listen or they don't care or they're dismissive of my experiences. And I don't know that I necessarily have the complete answer to that, but I started, you know, just with recording my story for myself, not even for the podcast, but just, you know, speaking my story out loud to myself, listening to it play back to myself. And I found that that was very therapeutic. It didn't heal all the trauma, but like it just sort of gave me a starting point. And the more you like practice using your voice, the stronger your voice gets. And so that's sort of my hope for the podcast. And like, as you were talking about, this sort of ties into other areas of my life. So one of them being um, how I show up in my practice with my clients. And, you know, it really became apparent to me that um, hiding parts of myself in my therapy practice was not working for me or my clients anymore when I went on maternity leave. This statement that I heard over and over from my clients was that they felt abandoned when I was leaving on maternity leave. And it wasn't totally my fault or their fault that that came up. I was pregnant, um, I conceived in January of 2020. And so by March 2020, when my belly started to show, we were behind screens, right? So nobody could see. Right. Yes. Everything was virtual. <laughs> yeah. So they knew about it, but it wasn't obvious to them that I was going to be leaving. But there was this other thing that they kept saying, which was, you know, we forgot that you were a human being. We forgot that you had this like life outside of therapy. And at first I kind of like laughed it off, but then I realized like, what am I doing that I'm creating this almost like a double life where, you know, I'm showing up in one way in my professional life and completely differently in my personal life. I, I think it's important just for everybody to know that a lot of that has to do with the training we receive when we come into this profession. And that's ongoing training because we have to do continuing education credits. So we take classes every couple years in order to keep our license. And a lot of it is about this objectivity and not sharing the personal aspects of your life because of uh, transference and countertransference becomes a problem when you have that kind of dialogue. And at least that's what we're trained to understand. And so this is something that's deeply ingrained in our education. It's something that they reinforce on a regular basis when we're in trainings that you don't share the personal aspects of your life in the counseling sessions. And and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. You know, different people have different processes and it works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. And I feel like that's what you're saying, that you started to realize that you had this double personality. You were two different people and it started to feel like you were divided and you really needed it to merge. Definitely. And I like I knew this for years. 
right? Like this wasn't something that um, just came on suddenly. It was something that like I was noticing over the course of years of work, but I couldn't see a path forward. I couldn't see like how to bridge these two parts of myself. And I wouldn't say that like either one of them was like a false self. It just wasn't a complete picture of who I am as a human being. And the idea of like bridging them was something that like I knew I needed and I knew I wanted, but I had no idea how to do that. And I I really hadn't seen anybody doing that. And so, you know, it was something that I just kind of like tucked away in my mind, but it was kind of always, you know, present. And there was a lot of sort of like internal conflict about how I was showing up and it felt disconnected. You, it didn't feel good to be doing that. You felt like it's almost like you're not being completely honest with these people who come to you and they're being totally upfront about everything going on in their lives, right? And it's it's almost like this relationship is not not that it's not true, but we have we have unwritten rules in society that when you're in a relationship with somebody, there's some give and take. And I share some of me, you share some of you, and we have this going back and forth thing. But in therapy, we're not supposed to do that. So now we're supposed to come into this relationship that really means a lot to our clients because they really start to see us as a valuable asset in their lives. And yet they don't get to know us. We only get to know them. It just feels like it's, it doesn't feel authentic. Yeah. And like we work with our clients to help them be more authentic in their lives. Right. Right. Show up as their whole selves. And it just like the idea of, you know, not practicing what you preach um, really didn't sit well with me. It's like I'm encouraging these people to do this and yet I'm not willing to do the same thing. So I'm not taking my own advice. Right. There's some cognitive dissonance there, which is um, one of the aspects of my dissertation. I focused on cognitive dissonance. And just for everybody listening, that's where your behavior doesn't match up with like a belief that you have or some kind of cognition or thought, and you're behaving in a way in opposition, and it gives you this feeling of discomfort. Yeah. And like, where does that discomfort go? Right. So where did it go? Where did it go for you? Of um, chronic health conditions, I would say. For me, it turned out to be hives. I broke out in hives and I had to quit doing therapy because I couldn't continue on that way. I was sick all the time. Yeah. And so there was this really significant moment for me a few years ago. Um, I was going through like fertility treatments. I was doing my IVF injections in between therapy sessions. And there was this one experience where I actually had a miscarriage in the middle of one of my therapy sessions, which was absolutely devastating to me. And I just suppressed it, completely dissociated from the experience in my body and continued on the therapy session as best I could. And, you know, I think I did a relatively okay job, but ultimately, you know, that is not a healthy way of existing in any profession. Nobody would be asked to do that, I don't believe. And, um, you know, even just like reflecting on like, what if that had been a heart attack instead of a miscarriage? Right. And the truth is, like, if I'm being completely honest, if I was having a heart attack at that point in my life, I would have ignored it as well. I would have put it Oh my gosh. I know. (laughs) It's absurd. But I absolutely know that's what I would have done. I know what you mean. When you're in that moment, you really feel like you have to make the other person more important than yourself. Yeah. And like remove your humanity. Well, and your connection with your higher self, you're completely removing your most powerful asset uh, spiritually, where, you know, you're tuned in to your intuition and your guidance and therapists are supposed to cut that off and leave that at the door and not be their whole selves. Yeah. And the truth is too, that like I knew my clients and I have an excellent bond, right? Like I love my clients. I know they care about me. If I had been honest about what I was experiencing in that moment, they would have been completely understanding. Of course. Yes. And, and yet I still didn't do that because it didn't feel like an option. And I remember so many times like leaving therapy sessions was just knots in my stomach from all the stuff that I was just 
suppressing. Um, and it feels very different now. Like I have only just started the process of, you know, sharing a little bit more of myself, a little bit more of my personal experiences. And the feedback that I get from my clients now is like, you know, I feel so much more connected to you. I feel like you really understand. And I share very little. And it's made that big of a shift. And so it wasn't just having a negative impact on me. It was having a negative impact on um, the work that I was doing with my clients. And not to say that it wasn't good work, but it was very much uh, limited. I think that, you know, there was a ceiling of how much growth that we could accomplish in those sessions because of the limits I was putting on myself. Well, and, you know, just in any kind of relationship, professional or otherwise, when you can connect with somebody because you understand what they're going through, like as therapists, we're not supposed to share that. So if somebody was talking about something in therapy and you've had a similar experience, think of how understood they would feel if they knew that you'd been through something similar. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're really encouraged not to do that. But now, like what you're saying, they're saying, wow, I really feel so much more connected to you. And granted, the idea is that you want to keep a professional barrier and that connection's not always a healthy thing because of the transference and countertransference thing. And I understand all of that. But on a human to human level, it's everything. And I think like we're complex beings, right? Like we're capable of holding two things at the same time. You know, we're capable of holding professional boundaries and forming connections. We're capable of, you know, recognizing similarities in our experience and also, you know, withholding bias, right? Um, you know, and I think maybe that comes with skill as you, you know, move through the profession and have more experience under your belt. But sure. You know, I think a lot of people are really capable of doing those things in a way that like maybe our training didn't give us credit for. Real quick, before I get back to this topic, I want to know if you have a product or service that aligns with the content here on the Dr. Williams podcast. If so, this space could be your advertisement. Reach out to me by going to drwilliamspodcast.com. Okay, back to the episode. I agree. Yeah. So you brought up that you have recently shared some information about your life. And this is, this is a big deal because your life is unique in the way that most people cannot relate. And it also is unique in a way that puts you in a position of being judged because of the nature of how you met your husband. And this is something you recently shared on your podcast. I listened to it. I think that you did an amazing job and I can understand how that would be a vulnerable share. Do you feel comfortable talking about it now and sharing it with the audience? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, you know, two things at the same time are true, which is that, you know, I, I do to some extent feel comfortable talking about it and I also feel uncomfortable talking about it, um, but I'm willing to. And um, so, you know, to back up and and share those details my husband is incarcerated he was 15 years old and given a life sentence um and we met while he was incarcerated we got married in prison and we now have a son that we can see via IVF um and the truth is that it's not a terribly common story but it's not uncommon either and this is you know when I ask myself like why talk about this at all this is part of the reason which is that um in the United States there are millions of people who are incarcerated and they are also human beings they also have families and loved ones and partners and children and so there are these people who are impacted by the justice system and incarceration some of these people are my clients um, and, you know, talking about it helps people to see that like this, they're human beings, that this isn't, you know, an abnormal situation. It is kind of easy to just forget about people that are there because they're not in your daily life. And, and that's intense. And that is intentional. Yes. Yeah. Um, but as far as society goes, we don't talk about this much that there's people there that are they're living their lives in those buildings and they have connections outside. They have families. They have people who love them. They have people that they love. 
And they're also in a community in there forming relationships there. So it's really like a a separated world, except for the people that know somebody who's there. That's the connection to the outside world. It's kind of a, a unique way to live your life in, what, in a way that a lot of people don't understand. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of misinformation about um, people who are incarcerated and their experiences. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about people who are incarcerated, we talk about them as Um, you know, being dangerous to society and being aggressive or being illiterate, even like there's a lot of misinformation. And the truth is like the entire spectrum of humanity exists behind those walls. And some of the most intelligent, compassionate, loving, uh, funny, talented people live in prison. Um, and I've had the privilege of meeting a number of them through my husband and, and through some of my, um, advocacy work that I did previously. And it, like, it never ceases to amaze me, like how resilient their spirit is and how strong they are, but like, they're just human beings, you know, they're not different than the clients I see every day. They're people who have, uh, trauma, um, they're people who've had, you know, difficult upbringings, different difficult um, uh, childhood experiences that have led them to where they are. And I just fundamentally believe that we're here on this earth for connection. And that when we adopt this like practice of just kind of like throwing a people throwing people away and putting them in these like warehouses outside of society where we don't have to acknowledge them or talk about them um, or connect with them, that we're doing ourselves a disservice that, you know, when we, you know, treat everyone like a human being, that's when we will, um, sort of see the best in the world. Um, and so that's how I choose to live my life. And I, you know, now having a son, you know, we just really want to be an example to him of our values. And so like, keeping this hidden in any area of my life. I'm very open about it in my personal life, but, um, but keeping it hidden in any area of my life just doesn't feel congruent with how, you know, I want to raise our son and the the values and beliefs I want to instill in him. How old is he? He'll be three very soon. Okay. And does he understand what, what's his level of understanding? He knows his father's in prison. We talk about it as jail because that's the word that he's familiar with. Um, And the conversations that we have had is just, you know, people do go to jail when they make mistakes and that people deserve second chances. We all make mistakes. I try to encourage my son to make as many mistakes as possible because I know that is how we learn the most and that's how we grow. And so, again, it's like, you know, if I'm going to teach him these things, I need to also practice them. So has he ever spoken with his dad? Oh, yes. They talk all of the time. Okay. Our like in-person visits have been limited quite a bit because, again, when he was born, it was in the middle of the pandemic and yeah. they shut down visits to the prisons for um, over a year. Um, yeah. So like going back to my birth experience, you know, a lot of isolation during that time because we weren't able to communicate. So there's a lot of barriers. And also it's a um, international relationship. He's in the U.S. I'm in Canada. So a lot of barriers. And actually, I thought about that when you were talking about having a miscarriage in that therapy session. I was thinking how alone that must have felt for you. And then even going home, you still you don't have your husband there for the support there. So it it felt very well, it made me really appreciate how strong you must be to go through those things and not have the support system that so many people do at, in their home life. Mm-hmm. You're in love with a man who you can't be with, who can't hug you and console you when you both are going through a loss. And how how terrible that must be for him because he can't also receive that from you. Mm-hmm. It feels very lonely and I don't know, kind of sad, but yeah. also has this underlying strength in it. Yeah. And it is very lonely at times. I'm not going to deny that. But one of the things that um, this situation has brought to our relationship is really strong communication. Like it would not 
work and function without really good communication. And he is a very um, emotionally mature person. And so he's able to support me on an emotional level just through conversations in a way that I've never experienced before. And so I won't say that I went through it alone because I didn't. He has been with me through the loss of my grandparents and, um, you know, he supported me many, many times over on an emotional level. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's not natural. We're not naturally, um, supposed to be separated from the people that we love. And so it does definitely take a toll. Sometimes it's hard. We have to overcome those challenges and, and it's definitely not always easy, but there's never like a time where I question the decision to make this commitment. Well, and it really goes to show how strong love is, because if you guys can get through all of that in that situation, I mean, that's, that's a strong love. Yeah, I agree. And I guess like one of the things that I thought about going into this relationship was the impact that it would have on him. Um, You know, I just knew that if I wasn't able to commit to it, to being with him for life, even if he remains in prison the entire time, that um, I, I shouldn't even start the relationship like that would be too harmful for him right? To start something like build a relationship and then abandon him. And so I wasn't going to do that. And so it took us a long time of talking about our feelings and talking about the future and talking about, you know, whether this was the right thing to do before we even decided to have a relationship, a romantic relationship, I should say. But once I made the commitments, I knew, you know, like, this is it for me. Um, And I was happy to do it. Like it, it has fulfilled me in a lot of unexpected ways. And I think, yeah, part of our philosophy on our relationship is that uh, we we're in control of our lives, that like we don't get to dictate the circumstances or the challenges, but we get to decide how we respond to those things. And so, you know, we really like operate from a place of prioritizing freedom, freedom of choice. And so, you know, when we wanted to get married, there wasn't a lot of options and there were a lot of barriers, um, a lot of attempts that were (laughs) um, squashed by red tape and all sorts of things, I'm sure. Lots. (laughs) Lots. <laughs> That's a whole other story in and of itself. But yeah, but we were like, okay, you know, we don't have control over these things, but if we want to get married, we're going to find a way. And so we did, right? Like it took us two years to overcome all of those barriers and we got married and, and it wasn't the, you know, dream wedding that I had always imagined, but we made it really special in our own way. And so we take these opportunities to create freedom in our life that. Uh, mean so much to us um, that maybe don't look exactly how we expected it to look. um, But still, it's like taking back your power and taking back your sense of control. And that's just how we operate on a day-to-day basis. So even the decision to have a child, you know, it didn't look how we imagined it would look. Um, But we embraced that and we're, you know, forever grateful that we did. And so, that I guess that's one of the ways that we get through the challenges and um, overcome our circumstances is just taking control of the things that we feel like we have control over and living our way our life in a way that most aligns with who we are. At some point, you do have to kind of say, "This is my life, and I'm going to make choices that make me happy and follow my own guidance, and not worry about what anyone else thinks or." their opinions or anything that has to do with my life. And that brings me to the question of, do you have support? Do you have family support from your side or his side or both? There are a few members of his family that I'm in contact with that are very supportive. Um, He lost contact with a lot of his people when he went to prison. Um, It's very draining. It's very difficult to maintain relationships with people who are incarcerated. And um, again, I think it's quite intentional. They're, you know, they intend to keep them isolated. And a lot of people don't have the ability or um, financial resources or strength to be able to do that. So he lost a lot of his connections. 
um, when he went to prison. And uh, our family is very supportive of me, of our relationship, and of him. They have very strong bonds. Wow, that's incredible. The the whole thing is very incredible. So have you shared this with your clients? Do they know that you are married to somebody who's incarcerated? Some of them do and some of them don't. So the times when I have decided to share it is when I have a client who's been affected by incarceration themselves. Um, Again, it's like, how can I support these people if I don't also share that I'm impacted by it, that I have this understanding. It just didn't ever make sense. Um, But most of them don't. And so, you know, if they're listening to the podcast, which I know some of them are, this will be the first time that they're hearing that. Okay. How do do you feel about that? Good. Yeah. Again, like, I won't say that I don't have any, like, anxiety or nervousness around it. um, But I know it's the right thing to do. And not just for me, but also for them. And I hope that they appreciate it. I hope that they listen and that they understand, you know, my um, values underlying why I'm sharing that. Um, And also understand why I didn't share it up until this point. Um, But, you know, they're going to have their reactions to it. And I just sort of honor that and, and respect however they feel. Yeah. Well, you're no stranger to barriers. And this seems like another one that you're breaking through and really kind of paving the way, which I admire. And I'm sure that others also admire therapists and clients and those who have been incarcerated, those who love people who have been incarcerated or are incarcerated. You know, you have this, this perspective that and this role in life, your career, Um, just who you are and what you're about, where you sharing this is helping so many people just to hear it. And I really feel like I understand coming into the field of psychology and mental health, like we have this innate desire to help people. And that's really at the, the foundational level of going into the field. And it happens for many different reasons. Um, we're people and our life experiences lead us to come into the field. And sometimes that gets lost and people forget that, that many people who are working as a therapist have their own traumas that led them into wanting to help people. And I think that we need to remember that. And this is important for the field to support that we are Real people, we want to be our whole selves, and we can still help people with them being their whole selves. We don't have to omit who we are. And I appreciate so much that you're sharing this with the world. I think you are tremendous, and I admire you, and I support you, and I can't wait to see where it takes you because I really feel like you are at the forefront of some very important things. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And I just want to add that, you know, therapy is what I do, but that's not who I am. And I think I've always known that on some level. And so now I sort of envision myself stepping into more of a role that reflects who I am as a whole person. And I'm even, you know, moving away from therapy in general. Um, You know, if I could define who I am, I think I'm a healer. And one of the most powerful ways that I know to heal trauma is by using your voice. And so podcasting and healing and trauma recovery, it all just kind of like fits seamlessly together. And I'm excited to kind of yeah, like bridge those parts of myself and find this like more authentic version of myself. And it's a work in progress. Like this is just the beginning. And so I hope to be able to share my challenges with it and also my successes. And yeah, thank you so much for your kind words and yeah, and giving me the opportunity to practice this. I, absolutely. I am, I'm grateful and I appreciate that you are here and sharing your story. I know that you um, didn't feel comfortable doing it up to this point. You had had other offers to do interviews on other podcasts and you kind of just been staying away from it. So why now? It's just the next step in my healing journey, right? Like I'm 
you can't move forward if you don't step outside your comfort zone. And, you know, I think that baby steps are appropriate that like, you know, if it doesn't feel like the right time, it's probably not. Um, but I've been taking those baby steps and pushing myself a little bit more and sharing a little bit more of myself. Um, talking to you felt really comfortable for me in part because we do have this shared background of working in therapy. Um, and and also your demeanor and your presence. Um, but it, it felt very natural to be talking to somebody who gets it and who, you know, isn't judgmental and um, and you created this space for me. And so, you know, I thought if I'm ever going to do it, I'm going to have to take that risk. And this felt like a natural next step. So thank you. All right, guys. Well, I hope that you will go and check out the Healing Mama podcast. And um, there may be an opportunity for Dallas and I to reconnect and have her back on the show. There's some more parts of her story that she hasn't shared yet. And when she's ready to do that on her podcast, we will have her back to discuss it more. Thanks again for being here. This has been really um, an incredible conversation. Thank you so much. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can show your support by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. You also can follow Dr. Williams podcast on all social media platforms and subscribe on YouTube and by going to www.drwilliamspodcast.com. Deliberate creation is the key to living life satisfied. And that is my wish for all of you.